Hi, so yeah, as um, Natasha said, I'm Jess and I am a PhD student at the University of York. I'm under the supervision of Dr. Amy Little and Professor Nikki Milner. Um, I am just coming to the end of my first year, so this is very much kind of a preliminary uh, analysis that I've undertaken so far and a bit of background as well. Just before I start, I just would appreciate if um, there are no pictures taken of certain slides because it is unpublished data and star car is a hot topic as I'm sure you all know. <laughs> so um, it, the slides are blue and they've got an asterisk if it's unpublished data. Most of it isn't because I, as I said, I'm quite early on, um, but just as a, an, an appreciation if you don't mind. So before I start, I thought it would be uh, worth just explaining to you sort of the, what's driving my research and why I'm undertaking this as part of, well, for my PhD. So I want to look into the way that space is constructed in and around structures on Mesolithic sites. And from collecting this data through microware analysis of the flint assemblage, I then want to use this data to explore the ideas of social spaces in relation to tool using activity areas. So how am I going to do this? Well, I'm using the site of Star Car, as I mentioned. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the site, I'm sure most of you are, but um, it's a early Mesolithic site located in North Yorkshire um, in the UK. And it was occupied roughly from around 9,300 to 8,500 BC. So it's around 800 years worth of occupation there. We're not sure exactly whether it was constant occupation, the likelihood is, is that it was intermittent, but we do have evidence for humans there across those 800 years. Um, and just to put it into context, we are dealing with a time when uh, the UK was still connected to mainland Europe through the land bridge of Doggerland. And that's just worth noting when looking into, or, uh, when I explain the sort of implications for this research. It's also worth noting that Star Car is part of a network of other sites around a paleo lake, Lake Flixton, which again causes implications for when we're interpreting the site because it is a part lake, part dry land site. So the, the site was first excavated in the 19, late 1940s by Graham Clark at Cambridge University. And really from a very early stage, it was characterized by exceptional organic preservation, as you can see in the image behind me. It was then re revisited by Professor Nikki Milner and her colleagues at Universities of Chester and Manchester in the early 2000s. And as you can see again in the images behind me to my left and to your right, um, the site has a really beautiful display of wetland and dryland areas. And when, when Professor Milner went back and excavated, it was um, the full extent of the site was essentially opened up or as much as we could excavate at the time. And this gave us a real picture of exactly what was happening at the site. So what did we actually find during the excavations? Uh, this is especially the ones from 2000. So this is not discussing Clark's, um, Clark's excavations. So most notably, as I said, the organic remains are exceptional and this is really highlighted through the antler frontlets. We found an additional 12 antler frontlets during these excavations. And these are humanly modified and a skull, a red deer skulls with antlers, as you can see from the splitting of the antler. We also found the first evidence of mobile art or the earliest evidence of mobile art in Britain through the shale pendant. And this is an engraved pendant that's perforated with flint. And we found also accompanying that with shale, with shale beads. And then also we found some really beautiful wooden artifacts. So the digging stick being a really beautiful example and birch bark rolls, which were obviously um, well used for tar production. Now onto the flint, which is why it's relevant to the session today. So there were over 24,000 flints found. And as you can see by the black dots, a lot of these are located within the dry land areas of the site. And this is why my research is really focused within these areas as this is the kind of hot spots. And although I don't, you don't need to work out the nitty gritty, the, the colors here that you can see in the dry land areas, they represent the structures. And as you can see, again, the black dots are really quite concentrated around these areas. Most of the flint was actually made from till flint. And um, it's worth noting that 16% of the assemblage 
was burnt, which obviously has implications for the microware analysis. So, in terms of the evidence of structures, which is the sort of main part of my research, so there's evidence of at least three structures at Starcar. Um, and this is excluding the wetland areas. So, as you can see in the pictures to the bay bottom of the screen, there was a beautiful array of, of, of wetland platforms that were discovered within the lake fringe. Within this, as you can see the, the image here, on the, on the sort of fringe between the, the wetland and the dry land. And this is not part of my research as you have to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> um, and so for the dryland structures, um, I will be, so in my presentation, whenever I talk about structures, I will be talking about just the dryland areas. These three structures have a very different character. Each of them has their own sort of signature, and I will hopefully be able to explain this further as I go through. So firstly, I just wanted to I sort of present the star car structures in a context. So what else have we found from Britain in regards to um, structural evidence. So from these other Mesolithic sites within Britain, famous ones again, so Howick in Northumberland and Mount Sandal in Ireland being probably some of the other most famous ones. These both late, uh, date to the late Mesolithic and have varying uh, evidences of structures. Mount Sandal is evidenced by oval shaped pits, whereas Howick, um, Howick evidences three structures that are kind of a dipped hollows. As relevant for today's session, the microarray analysis undertaken on both these sites was fairly extensive, um, but both sites, as I said, do, do date to the late Mesolithic, so in terms of comparability to star car, there's nothing really of a, of a sort of, of a comparison really. And so I really want to emphasise with this slide that star car is a unique site, and that's why it is this, the focus of my research. And with the fact that it has three structures within one area, it really offers us a real sort of opportunity to explore the ideas of using space. Just to give a bit more of an idea of the types of deposition we're seeing with the flint, I chose this example that was undertaken by Professor, sorry, Dr. Amy Little, giving her information now. Um, and um, she undertook microarray analysis on the flint, on some of the flint from Star Car. This is a wonderful example, I think, because it's showing essentially a flint cache and microarray analysis showed that all of these flint pieces were undertaken within an animal processing activity. And because of the deposition, so this is within the wetland platform, the deposition of the flint is quite clustered as you can see. And from this, the interpretation of this, of this deposition is that it potentially was wrapped in a bag or some kind of container, which is subsequently disintegrated. And these flint pieces have then fallen around the structure. So I think by, by sort of bringing in this, the richness that you get from microware, from refitting, and from this close excavation of archaeological material, I think you can really begin to see the depth of interpretation that can be gained. This flint cache was probably used within one type of activity, and it does make you wonder why. It's, beyond, it's going beyond function, it's going beyond efficiency. Something maybe slightly interesting is happening with the deposition, and I wanted to see if this is also reflected within the dryland areas. So how am I going to do this? The method, as you can see behind me, is quite typical for microarray analysis. Um, as the, the flint is a huge, there's a huge assemblage of flint, I'll be plotting different typologies around, different, around the structures to essentially organize a subsample that I, can, that I can aim to do within my three years. I'm looking at around 400 to 500 pieces. So as you can see, the, the spatial plots of the flint, or sort of some of the typologies behind me, the typologies are giving us glimpses at possible activity areas or possible different uses of these structures. The central structure in the middle is in all four. So this is blades, dry, um, the blades, uh, microburin, striker lights, and scrapers. The central structure within all four seems to be clearer than the other two. So you can begin to see from these typologies that we're getting glimpses are what we could interpret from the microware analysis. And I think for me, this shows that typologies are, are really interesting, but they also can only take you so far when you want, when looking at these tools and how they're used, especially within a, a, a settlement. So as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Amy Little already has undertaken a small microware analysis of some of the flint based on 126 positive identifications of microware polish she was able to, 
show hints at potentially the different uses of these structures. So you've got, again, the central structure showing quite a different signature to the, the eastern and the western structures. So again, we're hinting at this potential different usage of these structures. So to give you a bit of a glimpse of what I've been up to, um, again, this is just, this is very preliminary. So please don't take these, what I say now is sort of the be all or end all of my PhD. I have been looking at blades within the eastern and central structures as they are the most complete structures that we find with hollows and, and post holes around it. As you can see from the micrographs, please, sorry, could you mind not taking in the picture? Sorry, the, this is the unpublished stuff, sorry. <laughs> So from, you can see from the micrographs, um, there, there, there's plant working evidence, which is quite typical for blades, as we've heard earlier. But there's also a, a variety of other activities. So unlike other, sort of other sites that we see within the Mesolithic and also the use of these different structures, Starkar doesn't seem to have this sort of structure based to his particular activity. We, in fact, see to, seem to see a sort of variety of activities being undertaken within the structure or these structures, which again, like I said, is quite different from stuff that we've seen from other Mesolithic sites. However, this is just preliminary. And so just to sort of draw it to a, towards a conclusion, what can we say when we tie in the chronology within the, the site? So we're very lucky at Starkar, we have a really complex chronology that's been created. So the central structure, as you can see, is very much linked to the earlier occupations of the site, whereas the Western and the Eastern structures are linked towards the more middle, sort of later occupations. So for me, when we link this in with a microware analysis and the, the, the information gained from the typologies, it adds so much nuance to our interpretation because we're able to say, well, the likelihood of seeing a slightly different pattern in the use of the central, central structure is perhaps not that surprising when it was definitely occupied and lived in by a different generation of individuals. And I think also it then sort of begins to colour your interpretation in regards to the Western and the Eastern structure, with perhaps there being a more of a link between those structures being potentially contempor contemporaneous or at the very least visible during the similar, a similar period. So just to conclude, what do I mean by social implications and how am I going to try and access that through the structures? From ethnography, we know that dwellings can sometimes be far more than just homes and homes can be more than more than dwellings and so I think for me I want to really try and access what these structures were and we don't know what they looked like and we don't know how they were used however I do think microware analysis hopefully will be able to give us some insight into this and when chronology is added to our understanding of the microware analysis I do think you get a richness of what people were actually doing at the site rather than just identifying areas of activity, which is really exciting, but we're able to put people back into the picture, which I think is really important for looking at, at, at sites, but especially within prehistory, when sometimes it's all too easy to forget that these distant people in the past were present and they were acting and active within the site and making and curating these areas. So thank you very much for listening and thank you to the session organisers as well for accepting my, my presentation.